Hello, and welcome to this uh, special episode of my new health and wellness series being featured on the Norfolk Community Television Station. On each episode, I aim to bring thought-provoking guests in the local community who are elevating the lives of those around them through their work and practice. With me, I have Mr. Brian Craby, who is a teacher in law, history, and philosophy at Mills High School. And the reason why I wanted to bring him on today is because, man, he brings so much to the table and he's teaching kids how to think critically, be open-minded and think for themselves and understand morality and values at an early age that will propel them in life and give them the tools to be a more successful individual and for and enable them to feel comfortable in their own skin and empower not only themselves, but to also through that inspire others. And I, I, I'm just so happy that he's on the show. And I think you guys can learn a lot from him in terms of so much to the table. Let's just dive into it, Mr. Kirby. So how are you today? I'm well. I'm really, I want to thank you, Merrill, for having me on the show. Uh, Merrill was in my class, what, four years ago, Merrill? Maybe? Uh, yeah, three or four. And one of the most important things I think that we don't do well uh, as a culture is listen. You know, we, we like to talk a lot. And we, we like to say what we feel and what we think after not a lot of research. Uh, but Merrill is one of the best listeners I've ever had as a student. I mean, eye contact, really, really listening to what a person says, being open-minded, but uh, also thinking for himself. And I'm so proud that he's worked, uh, moved on now in college <laughs> into the communications field. Um, I think Merrill is going to do a lot with his life. So thanks for having me on, Merrill. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for those kind words. Okay, so let's get into um, why you teach kids to think critically for themselves, dive into epistemology and, and, and maybe why we should not neglect and just go mindlessly throughout our lives and, and why it's so important to do that. It's a great question. So first, um, intro to philosophy was a class that was actually inspired by students at Mills high school. It wasn't something that I came up with. Um, some students came to me and said, Mr. Craby, you know, you're, you're really philosophical. At the time, I was teaching U.S. history and law and sociology. We would really like to have this, this class because you really, you really talk about things in a different way and you, you connect different things that we never really thought of before. And uh, lo and behold, I asked Mr. Mullaney, our principal, if this was possible. And he had me write up a um, description of the vision I would have for the class. And I sat there and thought to myself, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this right, okay? I'm not going to give them a textbook like I got when I was in college in the philosophy class that I took that was terrible. Basically, tell me who Socrates was, tell me when he lived, what he said, and then the professor would want you to regurgitate back to him what he said about what Socrates thought and said, which to me was very uninspiring. Um, the teacher I had in college. And so I basically wrote the most controversial paragraph in the history of public education because I thought, you know what? I, I'm going to do this the way I'd like to do it. I want to talk about consciousness. I want to talk about spirituality. And I'm not, I don't mean religion. Okay. I'm not talking about, about indoctrinating anybody in what I believe. I'm just saying spirituality is a way of being. And I really created the class off of the students' interests. So my first year, I really was, what do I do here, you know? And I found a pretty good uh, website that, because I do not have a textbook, and it, uh, the website is called Importance of Philosophy, which has its own bias, I must admit. Um, some of it is a little bit way far conservative, um, but I, I like how, it ha how it's sort of like a textbook where we're gonna build our skills. So the first thing, as you brought up, Merrill, we talk about is epistemology. For those of you who don't know what that means, it's the study of a question, right? And the question is, how do we know anything? How do we know anything? Well, we have to build skills, thinking skills, to be able to know anything. Mm -hmm. So when anybody says anything to you, you need to be able to identify where it is they're coming from when they say it and obviously they think it before they say it because our words are merely a vibration of a thought which is an entity 
And when we say entity, an entity is defined as anything that exists, right? So we know, I mean, all of us as human beings, what do you think the percentage of the, during the day, are you living in your head? Well, most of it, I would say, right? 90, 95%. And we have thought patterns, right? You may catch yourself thinking the same thing over and over again, which believe me, I am not a Tibetan monk. I, I'm not here to tell you that I, uh, I have all the secrets of the universe. The last few months have been very difficult on me psychologically, sitting at my home through this lockdown with my children, trying to educate them, trying to educate my students, feeling claustrophobic uh, um, and catching myself in negative thought patterns. So let's, you know, I'm not telling you I know everything, but let me just say, we're talking about a high school philosophy class, which really most people don't get exposed to until freshman year in college, sophomore year in college. And rightly so, because you do need some experience um, to be able to grapple with these big questions. So anyway, let's begin with logic. Okay. It's a very left brain concept. Um, and a lot of this philosophy of Western philosophy comes straight out of the Enlightenment, 1700s and 1800s. We're talking about people like Voltaire, who tackled free speech, right? We're talking about um, Adam Smith with his wealth of nations and his economic policies. We're talking about people who really said for the first time, and let's take this with a grain of salt, emotions aren't real. And emotions actually block us from knowing the truth. I disagree. I do believe it is very important to be able to be logical and we'll give some examples. But let's not forget what, at this point, Meryl and I were talking before we came on here, that we're leaving an, an old paradigm of thinking. We're moving into a new uh, era of history. What about our heart? What, what, why do we assume that feelings are not, aren't real? I mean, I, I know that chemical reactions and the neurons and all, and, and, and the chemical and biological things, but what really is it? And when you really stop thinking, you can feel it. And I think what I'm saying about the last three months being difficult for me is I feel something in my heart that is bothersome about what's happening in our world because I love my children more than I could ever explain. I don't think it's just an emotion. It is an eternal energy. Love is an eternal entity. But we are indoctrinated to believe, because partly of the Enlightenment, that we're only a physical being and we only have five senses. And those five senses tell us what is real. But those of us who have opened up our minds and our hearts have realized that we've had experiences in our lives that maybe we have convinced ourselves weren't real, that actually were real. Because it goes beyond the five sense perception of what we think is all there is. Correct, Mel. So back to logic. When someone makes a statement, and half of the statement is saying A, but then they get to the second part of their statement, and it completely contradicts A, and you read that paragraph, and you get to the bottom and you get to B. And it's quite obvious, politicians do this all the time. They don't say the truth. They mix truth with fiction. Using logic is saying, dude, you just said this, and now you just said this. You have no value in your statement. Now, that doesn't mean the person doesn't have value. Mm. It's okay to be wrong. I don't understand why people, why they have to be right all the time. I, when, when I'm wrong, I take it and I go, you know what? You're right. Mm. You know, why, do, why does everybody have to be the big guy? Why does everybody have to be right all the time? Mm. We don't learn by being right. The best lessons in life are the ones that are difficult. So logic is such an important thing to practice and to know. That would be one example, right? 
mm -hmm. could talk about um, deduction. Well, oh, sure, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead, Meryl. Well, I was just going to say, um, you know, you said an important point how people are very uh, mind oriented and identify with their mind where if you fall out of your head and stick into your heart, that's where the real magic happens. We can dive into metaphysics going into this, but I want to say this. There's new profound science and research coming out about the power of your heart and how if you look at the energy centers or body that's been documented by the Chi first of the Chinese a few thousand years ago with the acupuncture and the meridian system in our body, and we now know that our emotions directly linked with our, the energy system of our body with our chakras. If you have a throat, if you have a communication problem, you're gonna feel like your throat is weaker. Anyways, with the heart specifically, you have the Heart Math Institute out of California that was established in 1991 that has documented that the heart gives off its own uh, frequency that can be read by a device called the magnometer. And it's been documented extensively by the Heart Math Institute. And it proves that our heart is vibrationally giving off a frequency that interacts with our environment. Now, you may not be able to perceive that through the five senses, as you mentioned. Um, but once you're aware of that, it opens a new gate of what is possible and, and how you, you, how your inner space interacts with the reality in your outer world and how that is so imperative and why it is so true how if you live through your heart, you are aligning yourself to things that will gravitate towards you because it's aligned with that same vibration, vibrational. So for those who, who for those skeptics out there that are like, they, I don't know, I can't really conceptualize it. Um, because what about does it make sense with our current state of like what we know about physics or blah, blah, blah. How would you describe metaphysics and how it relates to that concept of vibration and how you are basically your inner environment reflects, like your thoughts become things. Your inner environment will reflect how you perceive the world. Well, metaphysics is described and defined as that which lies beyond the visible. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to just give it before we get into the other stuff. Sure. Wi-Fi, okay, Wi-Fi is an electromagnetic frequency. So right now, the, the, we're having a discussion through a, an unseen conglomeration of frequency. And that's okay, and every, everybody understands that. Well, could you imagine if we couldn't get access to the internet? Especially these younger generations that we have now, right? So metaphysics is difficult for a lot of people because you're talking about things that you can't perceive through the normal way that we perceive the world, right? right. And as I sort of alluded to in the beginning of the um, discussion, we're here, we're physical beings. But looking out our eyes is an essence Okay, so the first question I ask my class, other than the epistemology, is who are you, right? But the criteria for this question, I want everybody to think about this. You cannot say you are a carpenter, or you're a teacher, mm. or you're Brian Craby, or you're a football coach, or you're a surfer. Our bodies are not who we are. Our bodies are a vessel for an experience that is very, 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 very minuscule. You know, visible light. Visible light is literally 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.5. What we see and define as real is nothing. Mm. Is nothing. So who am I? Who am I? I'm eternal consciousness, having a very temporary experience called being human. And they tell me it's the year 2020, and it's June, and they tell me a lot of other things to believe, which I question. That, see, that's the thing about philosophy. You have to question reality. You can't just sit there, mm. especially listening to the mainstream news who literally make things up 
and then try to divide us so that we can't come together and unify mm -hmm. as, a, as one real true entity of consciousness, which is what we are. We are the same consciousness, Meryl, you and I. We are mm. just different points of attention. Mm. But so, we are the same essence. It's like a drop in the ocean. Yeah. So, so knowing that, and, you know, it's easy to focus on the negative. You know, our minds have this negative bias where there could be 10 good things in their day that are great, and then that negative thing happens. So, like, you knowing, you having an opinion that, the news is, is bad or this is, this is the, what the government's doing is bad. How do you, knowing the metaphysics and consciousness and who we really are, which I, I believe is just pure beings of light and energy, completely interacting with our environment, as you see with the Reiki practitioners who are able to, they are an antenna for chi energy to go flow through them to heal you, right? So knowing this and questioning reality, how have you applied these things into your life to make your life magical and inspirational and purposeful? Because, you know, when you look someone through the eyes or you see a children, like a girl or a boy, a little kid, girl, boy, like smiling or, you know, playing sports, or you see the inspiration of, 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 of someone who like gives someone $5 who really needs it. You know, that's what life's all about. That absolutely the, the positive things in life that, you know, move you, you know? So how have you applied these things in your life to knowing the stuff that there is bad? How do you flip it the right way and actually see all these things manifest into your life once you followed your heart and so forth? Like That's the synchronicities. Such a great, Meryl, it's such a great question. And I'm going to be honest with you. I've been struggling with it lately. Um, and there's a reason, Okay. First of all, I just want to say that um, when I lost my dad to cancer in 2016, we were very, very, very close. And anybody who has lost someone they love that much, a, a new perspective um, on life, I think, begins. I also have four young children. One is almost 11. Liam, one is almost, uh, just turned nine, Finn, Luca is seven, and my daughter Isla is five. And there's one obstacle, Meryl, there's one obstacle, because once you have children, your life changes. It, 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 and everybody tells you that, and until you actually, it actually happens, you don't fully understand, but it's fear, Meryl. Fear blocks us from aligning that which we really are to manifest into the three-dimensional world our thoughts that we want to create. But when we know that, it's so difficult because looking, looking at our world right now, it's scary. This, this is, I'm going to be honest, I'm concerned. And it's about my children. And so I'm sort of putting myself <laughs> in a thought process in which, what do I have to do to ensure their liberty, their happiness, and their security, right? And so I, I haven't been in a good place and I've been talking to my good friends about it. And that, what you asked me is, ex while I was just cutting the grass a few hours ago, was exactly what I was thinking. And can I just share one thing with you? This is Jeez. what I did. I came to a couple of realizations as I was outside. Beautiful, cutting the grass outside. I have, my garden is doing well. I really find a lot of happiness in gardening and being outside. So I also got to listen to music. The first song I listened to was the Moody Blues. They were a British, British um, progressive rock band, late 60s, and they had an album, I highly recommend to everybody listening, called Days of Future Past. Okay. Their most famous song off that album is Nights in White Satin. Nights in White Satin. And there's one part at the end, 
and he just says, I love you is, is the lyric. I love you. Yes, I love you. And I'm listening to it. Of course, I was thinking about my dad and how much I missed him. And I thought about fear. And I realized that you will never find peace in a state of fear. So that's my essential question for right now in this moment. How does one know through careful observation and questioning reality that there is darkness in the world, but yet still be positive and still manifest the magic? And my answer to your question is to do the things that, that make you vibrate at a higher frequency. For me, it's music. Then I listened to Van Halen. <laughs> and when I was about 10 years old on Christmas, Van Halen came out with a new album called OU812. And on that album was a, so a song called When It's Love. I again, what? and I this wasn't a conscious thing. I listened to two songs today that I wasn't thinking about. Right. And love, love was the message. And I don't know if it's because I'm getting older or what. You know, I'm going to be 44 in December. But I get emotional now about I, I, I get teary-eyed. Like, I watch Field of Dreams. Great film. I get I, I never, that's never happening before. It's almost like I'm mourning a loss of freedom or a loss of something. But yet, as you said in the beginning, we must inspire. For me, person other than my dad that passed away this year was Neil Peart. He was a drummer for Rush and lyricist for Rush. He passed away in January. And he had a huge impact on my development from a young adolescent all the way until his death, and even now. And his, his, his famous quote uh, towards the end of his life was, be your own hero. He didn't want me to be hit. He wouldn't want me to tell him what a hero he was to me. He would want me to be my own hero. What does a hero do, Merrill? A hero faces their fear and overcomes obstacles in times of darkness, right? So this is a very important time in our history in which we all have to take a stand with what means something to us. Mm. And the way we do that is through our ethics. For me, and this is a project Merrill did, and, and I think it's a great project for kids to do. It's called the Moral Compass Project, right? And in the Moral Compass Project, you have to pick four moral precepts that you identify as the way you are going to live your life. Sometimes we make bad decisions. We all do. Well, you know what? On that compass, we got to find our way back to whatever that is. And I don't know what those four are for you. But for me, I would have to say that they are liberty, respect, sincerity, and love. Mm -hmm. And I tried my best to live in accordance with those vibrations. And I try to inspire my students and my children and everybody around me to do what's right. Because when we look at the world, we see a lot of people that don't do that. <laughs> mm. Because people can't control you in a state of love. You only can be controlled in a state of fear. Man, it's so important to really dive deeply into who you are. Because if you don't know who you are and you're going, and yeah, maybe you have a, a really good job. Or maybe the outside, things on the outside that are seem luxurious and material. You know, those are great, but those will fleet. Those are fleeting. What, oh, yeah. what, what something that's always present is your innate being that's always with you. And I think why, why dissecting and going into and figuring out your values and your morals is so important is because that's what drives you. And that's going to make you successful. And that's what's going to make you influential. Because like as Dr. Michael Beckwith says, if you don't do you, you won't be done. And if you don't, dive into your morals, you are not, number one, you're not understanding who you are and you're, um, 
what you're actually doing is not allowing yourself to be expressed, which in turn is you um, not allowing the world to see who you are. And if you don't know who you are, you look at all the phenomenal musicians, all the successful teachers, um, people who have passion and drive and everything, who follow their dreams. I think why that is so inspirational, why it's so, so important is because they're just tapping into what makes them them. And it's just a byproduct. All the, all the money and all the, all the fame or all, all the things that come along the way, it's, it's just a byproduct of who they are as an expression of themselves. And we got a couple minutes left, but what do you think, you look around the world today, what do you think is the number one thing that people should be doing during this time of quarantine um, to maybe come out of this to be stronger or come back, bounce back happier? The outer world cannot manifest in the way we want it to if our inner world is not worked on. So we must take this time, and I, I have described the difficulty psychologically I've had, and I have no problem admitting that. And I've talked to many people who have also been feeling very psychologically um, down mm. over the past three months. That's normal. You know, this is new for all of us. But we have to find a way to go inside. Find some silence. Mm. Breathe. Don't think. Be. And when you look into the eyes of the people you love, remember that that's never going to end. That doesn't end. Love does not end. It's a force of nature, like gravity. Right. Fear is the absence of love. And that fear versus love is going on inside all of us right now. And it's waiting for us all to put the fear aside and to join in love for us to move on to the next phase of our natural evolution on planet Earth. Thank you so much for coming on again. Um, if you guys want to um, contact Mr. Craby, where do you, can, how can people contact you? Oh, oh yeah, uh, email um, anytime, bcraby, that is B-K-R-A-B-Y at millisschools.org. bcraby at millisschools.org. Send me an email, I, I get back to you as soon as I, as soon as I get it. All right, guys, thank you so much and have a great day.